first Sunday of October, we began a series uh, talking about our measures, but we, um, instant, we began what we called 50 days of standing in the gap. And it was a time of prayer and fasting to where we were going to be really going in two different tracks. One of them was to be praying for our nation as we approach the presidential election. The second was to take a look at measures that we have been talking about, things in our church that, that questions we need to ask ourselves to do, give us our own personal checkup to see how are we doing in uh, sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. And so as we have followed through here, uh, we've come through the election, and then they say, well, why did you keep this going? Well, because we need to continue to pray for our country. And so we go, the 50 days will end next Sunday. And so during this week, I want to encourage you, we want to pray for our country, pray for our president-elect, and pray for the direction uh, that we go as a, as a country. And then at the same time, take the things that, we've talked, that we will talk about today in this particular measure and internalize those. And our hope is that at the end of this 50 days, we've internalized these six measures while at the same time, we have been praying for our country. So today, to get us uh, kicked off, we want to review again our mission statement. The mission statement that we have built all of this series on is sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. And so if this is our mission, the question comes, how do we know if we're doing this or not? How do we know if we're really accomplishing this? And this question can only be answered by each individual asking themselves, am I being a transformed person who is sent to influence their world for Christ? And so in the midst of this, we have developed six measures. And we've talked about five of those. Let me just hit those real quick. The first measure was, have I met with God today? That every day we need to ask ourselves, have I met with God today? More than just maybe a five-minute devotion, but have I, have I had a, a time to where I've walked with him and, and talked with him and, and, and let him uh, have an influence in my life? Have I met with God today? Second of all, am I giving or taking? Am I a person that's more of a taker where everything's about me, or am I more of a giver? It could be giving of my resources, giving of, of myself to other people. And the third measure that we had is who are my 2 a.m. friends? Is there someone uh, or two people to where we can remove the mask and just say, this is who I am? No pretenses. This is both the front yard and the backyard. This is exactly who I am. And then build that friendship in such a way that when difficult times come, you know there's someone that you can call that can be there for you. And also when the great times come, that's a person that you can share these things with. The fourth measure that we had is, am I close to someone far from God? Am I close to someone far from God? Am I getting outside my Christian bubble and being able to make friends with people who are far from God? And the fifth one that we talked about last was, is my passport current? And what we mean by that is, is there a state of readiness? Am I ready if God calls me that whatever he calls me to do, am I ready? Financially, am I getting out of debt? Health-wise, am I trying to take good care of myself? Attitude-wise, do I have the right attitude to go? Margins in my schedule, are there margins there so that when God calls, I can say, Lord, I'm ready, let's go with it. So these are five measures that we've been talking about and asking you to be praying about these and to internalize these and to get a great understanding on what these are. Well, as you take this seriously and then constantly, periodically review these measures, there will be times when you are honest with yourself and you would say, kind of coming up short on this one. And if you're coming up short on this one, that's where the sixth measure comes in and that is, what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? I mean, if I look at these things and I say, yes, I, this is necessary for me to be a transformed believer who and then will influence their world for Christ, and if I'm not doing this, the question is, what am I waiting for? And everyone's got to ask this. And I, I was so looking forward to this because when we as a staff put our heads together to come up with these measures, we had five. And then we wanted to add this one, which thrilled me because it just kind of put the ball back in your court. It's you taking the initiative. It's not me taking the initiative. It's you taking the initiative, and you've got to ask yourself the question, what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? Whenever I think just this phrase, a verse of Scripture jumped out at me, and it's found in Matthew chapter 8. And if you've got your Bibles, you could turn to Matthew 8, 18 through 22. In Matthew 8, 18 through 22, 
is, is an interesting passage of Scripture to where Jesus has been at Peter's house. And as he's been at Peter's house, there have been healings that have been taking place. And Peter lives right there on the lake, on the Sea of Galilee. And all of a sudden, it's time for them to leave. And in verse 18, it says, and when Jesus entered, oh, excuse me, verse 18 it says, now when Jesus saw a great crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. He saw a great crowd around him, and he gave orders to go to the other side. In essence, he said, let's get in the boat. And he's asking people to come, and let's get in the boat, and we're going to the other side. And look what happens. And a scribe came up, and he said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. A bold claim. I'm there for you. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, we don't, we don't have points uh, to get into a Hilton. Uh, we're not going to be at a Holiday Inn Express. And he says, you can sit there and make bold claims all you want, but I've got to tell you, it's going to be a tough road. Most commentators, as they, as they just pick up this language, say this guy didn't go. I mean, he looked at it. It was tough, but he decided, I'm not going to do that. But that's not our focus. Our focus is the second man. And another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. First let me go and bury my father. Jesus did not come to these guys. They came to Jesus. They're standing over here. Jesus is trying to get them to the boat. They're standing on the shore. They walked over and said, hey, I'm with you, I'm with you, but let me first do this. And Jesus says, hey, here's the call. You want to get in the boat? Get in the boat. You're coming to me saying, oh, man, I'd love to get in the boat. I'd love to go to the other side, but let me first. Let me first. Mm. You know, we can almost let me first Jesus to death. And when this man said, let me first, at a cursory reading of this, you say, well, it makes sense, Danny. You know, his dad's, you know, sick, and he wants to wait till the funeral and do that. During those days in Jewish culture, is that whenever a family member passed away, you were to sit with them for 24 hours until they buried them. And they would always bury someone within 24 hours. And so as a family member, you would sit with your, your parent, your loved one, for those 24 hours, and then they would be buried. And so when this man says, let me first go bury my father, you knew that his dad had not died because otherwise he would be sitting at the bedside of his father. So what he did was he came to him and he says, you know, my dad's getting older, and so in his later years, I just want to be with him, and then whenever he dies, then I will come and follow you. And some of you, when you look at Jesus' response, say, yikes, that's kind of harsh. When he says, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead, he says, let the naturally, those that are lost, let them bury the spiritually dead, but what you need to do is you need to follow me. He says, you're just using your family as an excuse. I have called you to follow me, and you're saying, hey, but let me first. Let me first do that. You know, and I've shared this before, but whenever I read this, I just start smiling because uh, when my grandfather turned 75, I was six years old, and, um, and my mom came, and she says, we're all going to go to Auburn and for his birthday party, and I just want to let you know we're going to be coming. And I was six I didn't want to go to a 75-year-old birthday party. And, you know, I said, I really don't want to go. And then my mom, she kneeled down, got right in my face and said, you know, this could be his last one. So you really need to be there. I said, okay. And I went. And he lived to be 101. (laughs) Come on. What's up with this? Well, this is the same thing here. Hey, let me first. How long is that let me first going to be? Five years, 10 years, 15 years? Jesus is calling us to do something, and yet we're over here going, well, but let me first. Let me first. Let me first. I got to tell you, I'm thinking like college students or so, what if when you went to school, uh, that, uh, and, and, and that you're, you see this girl, and she's a real cutie, and you've seen her the first day of class, and you're thinking, God, you have found me my wife. This is incredible. And so you call her and you say, hey, I'd like to get with you. Would you like to go out with me? And say, oh, I'd love to, but you know, uh, first I got class. I got to get all my, what, my classes set up together and kind of get my work laid out. And so let me do that first. He says, okay, okay. So he waits a couple of weeks. Then he calls back. And when he calls back, he says, hey, you ready to go out? He goes, well, uh, 
Birmingham, allergies, they're driving me crazy. Let me first get over these allergies and then we can, we can go out. Okay, so then he calls again and he says, hey, you ready to go out? I said, oh, we got midterms, I gotta get through midterms. Let me get through midterms and then we'll go out. That's great, midterms in. He gives her a call and says, hey, you ready to go out? She says, I got drama tryouts. I got drama tryouts coming up. Got a lot of things I gotta memorize, but maybe we can do it later. Okay, so then he calls her later and says, oh, I got finals. Oh man, I can't do it, but hey, when we come back to school in January, maybe we can get together then. So sure enough, he gives her a call in January. He says, hey, you ready? He goes, step sing. Oh, we got step sing practice. I got to do all of this. But after that, then we will be set. Okay. So then he gives her a call, and all of a sudden she goes, well, you know, someone's asked me to help them with their SGA campaign and with the elections, and so I've got to work on that. Okay. All right. So then he calls her again. So then when he calls her again, she comes back, and she goes, oh, gosh, you know, finals are coming up, so I won't be able to get with you. But hey, next year, why don't you give me a call? All right. Can I just give you a scoop, guys? She does not want to go out with you. She does not want to. And you know that. You know that. I didn't have to be the guy to, to spring this on you. You knew that she didn't want to go out. But then we do this to God all the time. Let me first, let me first, let me first, let me first, let me first. And do you think that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are looking at each other saying, I don't really think they want to go with me. I don't think you're pulling the wool over anybody's eyes. You have excused your way here to here to here to here to just to keep from getting in the boat. I'm just going to stand on the shore and just hang out over there, and I'm not really going to get in the boat. Let me first. That's why we ask ourselves the question, what am I waiting for? You see, we could do all the shouldas and the couldas and the mightas and maybe laters and all that. We can do that for years and years and yet never progress in our Christian walk. Never be a transformed person who is sent to influence their world for Christ. So when we have those five measures, and we ask you to look at each one of those measures, then we want to come down to that sixth one. And if you're honest enough in those five, I'm pretty certain there'll be some that will come out and you'll say, I'm not really doing well in this. Then you need to come to number six, you need to ask yourself this question, so what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? Why, why I keep, do I keep putting this off? And this is what Jesus was asking these followers when he was saying to them, you know, what, what are you waiting for? So here's the question. Two things I want you to think about. First of all is this, why the urgency? <clears throat> why the urgency? You say, Danny, what is so urgent about about all of this. So when you put number six and says, what am I waiting for? It's a call to action. It's a call to initiative on there. So what would it be? Let me give you three things as to why the urgency. Number one, the brevity of life. The brevity of life. In James 4.14, look what he says. James says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. The brevity of life. We realize that life is like a mist. It's here today, and then it's gone tomorrow. And so, uh, David, can you leave that verse up on here? Uh, when he talks about a mist, and you think about it, just a little time, and then all of a sudden, it vanishes. And what it means is that life moves so fast. You want me to give you an example of how fast life moves? 42 days from now is Christmas. Look at that. Ooh, I think we just took the tree down two weeks ago, and uh, now i got to go put that thing back up. And most of the lights don't work, so I don't really want to put it back up. But, uh, but all of a sudden, you say, golly, it's just like Christmas was just the other day. I said, that is so fast. And then the other thing is, is that we really are not guaranteed another day. There was a study that was shown that in the United States, 6,775 people die every year. Every day, excuse me, not every year, every day. That means like 282 people die within this hour that we are worshiping together. And we would just realize that we're not guaranteed a tomorrow. And so with the brevity of life, knowing that I have been created by God for a purpose for life, then I want to take advantage of those times. And when I come to number six and say, what am I waiting for? I need to add to that. You know, life is brief. I need to get after it. But number two is this, the uncertainty of the future. The uncertainty of the future. In that James 4 passage, it says, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And nobody knows what tomorrow will bring. Nobody can predict what tomorrow is. Did anybody get that election right? You know, 
The first three days after the election, it was always, how did everybody miss it? The biggest upset in 220 years of elections. The uncertainty. The uncertainty of the future. And there's nothing that we can hang on to and guarantee and say, I know for certain that this will happen or that will happen. You've got no idea how long you'll be working in that same office. You have no idea how long you'll be attending that same school. You have no idea how long you'll be living next door to that same neighbor. Times change. You need to take advantage of it right now. The uncertainty of the future. And when you keep sitting there and saying, I'm just going to wait. Let me do this first. Let's just do this first. But this, but that, but this. And then all of a sudden, things change. Someone moved out of your office. They got transferred. They got moved. And then you looked around and said, you know, I started to share my faith with them, but I never did. I started to invite them to something, but I never did. I started to reach out to them. I knew they were hurting. I knew their situation. I knew they'd had a death in their family, and I knew they were hurting, and I kept saying, I'm going to go by and check on them, and I just never did, and now they're gone. That opportunity is gone. And that's why that sixth measure just needs to be haunting you when you think about it and you say, what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? I gotta get this and do this now. And here's the third, and that is the certainty of eternity and judgment. The certainty of eternity and judgment. Look at what Hebrews chapter 9 says. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says, And just as each person is destined to die once, and after that comes judgment. Stop right there. Everyone's destined to die once. We understand that unless Jesus comes first. Everyone's destined to die once. But then look what it says. After that comes judgment. It comes judgment. There's no question about that, folks. It's not like that when we die and leave this world, we go in some nether netherland. It says there will be judgment. And we'll be judged by the Lord of the universe. And there is the certainty of eternity and the certainty of judgment. And you say, well, what kind of judgment in that? Look what it says in verse 28. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. Stop right there. That's it. Every one of us has been far from God. Every one of us with our sins have caused us to be separated from God. And if we die in those sins and separated from God, then when we come to judgment, then we will be separated from God for eternity. Even the most logical thinking person would understand this. If I live my entire life separated from God, then why do I think that when I die, all of a sudden God's going to put his arm around me and say, hey, come on in and hang out with me in heaven. If you don't want to hang out with him on earth, you're surely not going to want to be with him in heaven. And so then he says, then you will be judged. You'll spend eternity in hell always separated from me because you chose to live in your sins. But it says here that Christ was offered once for all as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. And so what God did was he took his son, Jesus Christ, who came, lived on this earth, a perfect life, and then he paid the penalty for our sins. Because the Bible says that that the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus says, I tell you what, take all the sins of all mankind, put them on me, and I will die and pay the penalty for the sin. And it says here that he's done that. It's a once-time sacrifice for all of our sins. And when that happened, He died, they placed him in a tomb, and then three days later, God raised him from the dead. And that's what we celebrate on Easter. And that's why that's such a glorious day. Because without Easter, we have nothing, because we just have a a dead prophet. But because of Easter, we have a risen Lord who said, I am the Son of God. I will die, but three days later, I'll be raised from the dead. And he did. And he says, anyone who comes to me will be saved. And he gives us that offer, that invitation. And that invitation is for every one of us. And it's for all mankind. When you walk out of here and you go to lunch, the person that's serving you lunch, that invitation is for them. When you go to the gas station, you fill up, you walk in, you pay or whatever, died for him. The person in your office, he died for them. He died for all of us. And there's an invitation for everyone to respond. The certainty of eternity and judgment. And so the very first thing is, you just look at number six. Even if you haven't come to any of these, when you get to six, you say, what am I waiting for? My question to you is, what are you waiting for? Why don't you receive that gift today? It is offered. He has offered it. And when you do, so what happens if I do that? Well, if you do that, 
it says that at that moment, God's Spirit comes to live in your heart. And he says, you become a whole new creation. The old things are passed away. You become a new person. And it says that you're adopted into God's family. We're just talking about foster care and adopting children. You are adopted into God's family. And when you're adopted into his family, you've got all the, uh, all the rights of a child of God. And you get the power of the Holy Spirit to live with you. You've got the power to overcome temptation. You've got purpose in life. You've got significance for how you live. And then one day when you step out of this world, you step right into God's presence. And he welcomes you into his home and into his heaven. Wow. That's a great offer. And anyone can do that today. But you see, a number of us have done that. And when we come and take a look at these measures, and we say, what's the big push, Danny? Why are you saying... You know, why am I just waiting around on this? What am I waiting for? Well, we shouldn't be waiting for it. We should be moving forward because of the certainty of eternity and judgment. Because other people who die without Christ will spend eternity separated from him. And our goal is to take as many with us to heaven as we can. Look what he says. He says he's coming back again. And he will come again not to deal with our sins. That's already taken care of but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. And so when he comes back again, it's coming to gather his people and take them back home. And when that happens, there's no second chances. There's no, oh, can I get a do-over on that? And we got one shot. And so as believers, it's our responsibility to go into that sphere of influence that we have and to tell them the great news of Jesus Christ. So that's why the urgency. But let me give you this final thing, and that is how do you take the initiative? So how do you take the initiative? When it says, what am I waiting for, how do I take that initiative? When we say, what am I waiting for, we're wanting you to take the initiative and not wait on someone else to move you. You don't need to wait for me to preach a sermon that steps on your toes. You don't need to wait for an inspirational moment to decide to act. You ask yourself the question, what am I waiting for, and then take steps to make the changes. You take your own initiative. You know, we tell our kids this all the time. You need to take initiative. You need to make those decisions. You need to step forward, make these choices. And this is the same for for us in this. When it says, what am I waiting for? What I'm wanting to do as a pastor is put this ball in your court. Don't sit back there and if you just preach a sermon and step on my toes more, then I would do it. You don't need that. I'll be glad to do that. But You don't need that. That's not what you're waiting for. Don't sit there and wait for something. If I can just get inspired with a particular song, then I will do this. No. You have the initiative. You are the primary mover on this question. What am I waiting for? And you're the one that has to answer that question. You're the one that can act on that. And see, I like that personally. I want to be the one that's responsible. I want to be able to look at it and say, you know what, God? I'm not doing good in some of these measures, and I know it's my own fault, and I'm tired of waiting, I'm ready to move forward on this. And so how do you take the initiative? How do you get to that point to where you're having that special time with God? How do you get to that point to where you take the mask off and build that 2 a.m. frame? How do you get to the point to where you become a person who's more of a giver than a taker? How do you become that person who gets outside their Christian bubble and begins to make friends who are far away from God? How do you get to that point to where you've got that state of readiness to where whatever God says you're ready to go to where you can be just like the John Fogarty song in center field says, put me in coach. I'm ready to play to say, I am ready. Let's go. My yes is on the table and I'm ready to go for you. How do you get to that point? I'm going to give you two things that I want you to keep in mind. Number one is you have to see the grander vision. You have to see the grander vision in Luke chapter five, Luke chapter 5, Jesus is preaching, and as he's preaching, he's getting on the boats so he can get out and talk to more people. And as soon as the sermon's over, then the disciples who've been uh, fishing all night uh, didn't catch a thing. Jesus says, get in the boat and let's go out and and let's go catch some fish. And they don't really want to do that. And he says, just trust me on this. So they get out there, they throw the nets over, and they get a huge catch of fish. I mean, they've been out there all night. They caught nothing. Now all of a sudden they catch these. And as they pull the fish up on the, on the boat, all of a sudden Peter comes to Jesus and he says, I am a sinful man. He recognized his sin. And he says, oh, Lord, I am a sinful man. And at that particular point, Jesus gives him the grander vision. Look what he says in Luke 10, Luke 5, verses 10 through 11. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. From now on, you will be catching men. Grander vision right here. You're not catching perch, you're catching men. 
You're going from taking something that is just a task, an everyday task, and I'm getting ready to put you into something that has eternal significance. This is the grander vision, guys. Every time you think about fishing, I don't want you to just think about perch and how big their catch was. I want you to think about fishing for men, telling them the good news about the kingdom of God, helping lead them to faith in Christ. He says, this is what I'm putting you up towards. This is what I'm setting out before you, this incredible grander vision for them. And when they saw the grander vision, what did they do? And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him because they saw the grander vision. You see, the grander vision is more than getting a great education and more than getting a high-paying job. The grander vision is more than just gathering more stuff. The grander vision is living for Christ every day and being transformed into his image and then being sent to influence your sphere of influence for the kingdom of God. It is living with eternity in mind. You'll be able to answer question number six, what am I waiting for when you have the grander vision and realize this is eternity. This is not a church program. This is not something that Danny and the staff put together and it's a guilt trip that I'm supposed to walk through, not at all. This is dealing with eternity and the lives and the souls of men and women and young people. And the sooner we get serious about that, then the sooner we will be transformed people. And the sooner we will be those they will say, send me, Lord, to wherever it is so I can influence my world for Christ. And we can list all these measures down here. We can put everything out here, but it all comes down to number six, and that is what am I waiting for? Because you're the only one that can make that decision. I can't make that decision for you. I can't be the one that pushes you or prodded you that way. I don't want to do that. That's not my job. That's your job. You're a believer in Christ. That's your job. That's what God's called you to do. And so when you begin to walk around and think about that I'm not doing an impact for the kingdom like I should, you come to number six and say, well, what am I waiting for? And get that grander vision. It will completely transform your life. You get that grander vision. Because then all of a sudden you're seeing those people that before used to just kind of be obstacles <laughs> in your path of happiness to where all of a sudden you realize that they're people that Christ died for. And you say, you know what? I need to give a cup of cold water. I need to give them a hand. I need to help them up. I need to put my arm around them. I need to love on them. I need to tell them about who Christ is. I've got the grander vision. It's eternity in mind. Life is like a mist and like a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. What are you going to do with what you've been given? And I would love for you to just kind of almost emblazoned in your mind, sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. That's what I want to be. That's the person I want to be. So the first is to have the grander vision. The second is to embrace the 9-9 principle. You say, okay, now what's the 9-9 principle? If you send me a check for $30, I too will share with you the 9-9 principle, and you'll be wealthy overnight on that. Nah, what is this? Embrace the 9-9 principle. Matthew 9-9, look what it says. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. A tax collector. Nobody liked tax collectors, okay? And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Follow me. He rose and followed him. You know what the 9-9 principle is? When God says, follow me, I get up and follow him. That's the 9-9 principle. And I'm going to embrace that. And that is that if God ever says, follow me, I'm not going to say, let me first. Let me first do this. Let me think about it. But this, could have this, might this, not sure about this. No. What did Matthew do? Matthew didn't say it's tax season, it's a tough time. Matthew didn't sit there and say, well, let me get the book squared away over here. Matthew didn't say this. Or that. You know what he did? He just rose and followed him. Follow me, rise and follow him. Nine-nine principle. Think about it. And there'll be some times, who knows, to where I may put my arm around you somewhere walking down the, down the, uh, down the hallway and say, how's that 9-9 principle working out for you? Because if God has called you to follow him, you need to rise up and follow him. In a congregation of this size, a number of people that are here today, there are some of you that needed to hear this word today. Because God has been calling you for something particular. And you have struggled with it you just keep waiting, and then all of a sudden, today's the word you needed to hear. 
And you need to do what Matthew did. And that is, it says, he rose and he followed him. He says, you know what? This is what God's been calling me to do. This is what I'm going to do. And take that step forward. Hey, what are you waiting for? You're the only one that can answer that question. And so this morning, I want you to do an inventory and introspection of your life. If you've never made a decision to receive Christ as Savior, the question is, what are you waiting for? It's an incredible offer right there for you. And in just a moment, as we close in a word of prayer, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer, if that's your desire to do that. And then for others of us, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for to live that life for Christ, to be that sent, transformed believer who influences their world for Christ? Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And first of all, for those who are here but you've never made that declaration or that decision to be able to accept the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins, and you say, you know, today I, I want to start that journey I don't, I don't want to live separated from God forever. I'm going to voice a prayer, and I, you don't need to voice this out loud, but just in your heart to voice this to God. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I know that I am a sinner, and I take my sins, and I lay them down at your feet. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my life, to control my life, and to be my Lord, and to be my master. And Jesus, I ask you to guide me and help me take next steps to be a faithful follower of yours. Amen. Now, just keep your eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that if we ask anything of God, if we ask God to come into our lives, he will come into our lives. We pray that prayer of, of salvation. But what I would ask you is that at the end of this service, that on the uh, connection card, there's a place on there where you say, today I prayed to receive Christ. I encourage you to check that. Or even after the service, you may want to come down and talk to some of us. We'd be glad for that. And for the rest of us, Father, our prayer is that we would be a people that would have this grander vision and that when you call us to follow, that we will rise up and we will follow you. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.